Remembrance Day is observed in many countries on the 11th of November to recall the end of World War I, which happened on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Now, whilst clearly many lessons have most certainly been learned from World War I, we also know that Remembrance Day also commemorates the sacrifice of British and Commonwealth military and servicemen and women in World War II, as well as later conflicts. In other words, we haven't actually uh, learnt all the lessons that we need to from human history. War is still a feature of our age, the war in Ukraine being one such example. And I don't know how this makes you feel. Maybe the words despair and helplessness might come to mind. After all, our news is awash with one bad news story after another. What can we possibly do? Well, Jesus doesn't support the view that we should just be passive observers. After all, did he not encourage his listeners when he gave the Sermon on the Mount to be peacemakers, for they will be called children of God? In other words, Jesus invites each of us to promote the values of his kingdom in the spaces that we inhabit. Now, practically speaking, we might not be able to do anything of ourselves to bring an end to international conflicts, though we do know that God is at work through our prayers. But one thing that we can certainly do is to bring a foretaste of heaven where God has stationed us. And you might be thinking to yourself, you know, what difference could I possibly make in my small little world when there's all these global conflicts taking place. But then again, didn't Mother Teresa say those profound words? We ourselves feel that we are, uh, we ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean, but the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. We can make a difference. And as Christians, we are called to bring change and transformation in the spheres where we operate. And one way that we can do this in a world where people are far too quick to harbor bitterness and seek revenge is to model the way of forgiveness. Just think about that for a moment. If we were to be a people that modeled forgiveness, what kind of world would we be living in? There'll be less division, less cliques, there'll be less factions, there'll be less family breakups. Well, the prison cells, that would potentially be empty as well. There'll be less violence, there'll be less wars. Forgiveness is at, at the heart of the Christian faith. And this morning I want to look at what the Bible has to say about that topic. And I want to do that by looking at Matthew 6, 14 to 15, just two short verses. They'll come up on the screen, and I'm going to read them now. But if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Short, simple to the point, it's not complex, is it? It's not theologically complex. We know exactly what we are being told there. We must forgive others their sins if indeed we want to receive the forgiveness of God. We are called to model God's forgiveness to us. Simple, reasonable request by Jesus Christ, but how many of us are quick to keep a log of the wrongs that people have done against us. How many of us, followers of Christ, harbor bitterness and unforgiveness in our hearts? And I know that it happens in God's church because in my previous church, I used to find myself having a conversation with one individual and we spent all my time whilst I was there speaking about the same topic. You can forgive your parents. 
But after two years of trying with one gentleman, he said, no, I can't. Oh, he'd come to church. Oh, he wanted to receive the forgiveness of God, but he just couldn't get to that point. And he always used to wear a little backpack as well. And I always used to look at him and I think, wow, you're weighed down by unforgiveness. And I'm praying that he does find it in his heart to forgive. It's difficult, and so it's no wonder that Scripture is awash with reminders that we should forgive others. We've listened to what it says in Matthew's Gospel, but in Luke 6, 37, it says exactly the same thing. Forgive and you will be forgiven. I particularly like the way it's put in Mark's Gospel where it says in chapter 11, 25, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins, anything. I wonder how many of us come to church holding something against somebody else, and yet God says, you know, if you're coming into the house of God to pray to me, and you're holding something against someone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. I like the way that it is put in Mark's gospel because it affirms the point that one's relationship with God is in part based upon one's relationship with others. In other words, we can't come to God desiring relationship and wanting our prayers to be heard when we don't want to forgive other people. God is not going to overlook that. And gently, by His Spirit, He will bring each of us to that moment of conviction when we realize, yes, I've got to choose a different way. But why, one might ask, does God take this so seriously? I mean, it's repeated again and again in the Gospels, and then we get to the Epistles, we get to Ephesians 4.32, and we get to Colossians 3.13, and we're reminded once again, forgive others as God has forgiven us. Why do we find it repeated throughout Scripture? The simple answer is this. Jesus came to inaugurate God's kingdom on earth. And so what we see in the Sermon on the Mount and throughout Jesus' ministry, which ultimately leads to his death and crucifixion, is the establishment of God's kingdom on earth, a kingdom that centers on forgiveness and reconciliation, a kingdom that Jesus welcomes us all to be a part of through faith in him, and it's for this very reason that Jesus calls us to forgive others in the Lord's Prayer, which we said together, didn't we? In this church, oh, we said the words. Are we living out the words? It's for this reason that Jesus said to the remorseful criminal who has been crucified beside him, these words, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. There in that moment on the cross, Jesus was forgiving the remorseful criminal. We also know that Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. God came to establish his kingdom on earth, which is built on forgiveness and reconciliation. God is quick and ready to forgive, but are we willing to act likewise? The reality is that we who are in Christ know we should forgive. We know we should because we know that our eternal destiny depends on the forgiveness that God bestows upon us. We know that to be true, that without God's act of grace upon the cross where the forgiveness of sins is offered, we are finished. We are doomed to eternal death. And that is why God encourages us, forgive others. Because the cross was costly. The cross was where God suffered for our sake. Is God therefore asking too much of us to model his loving forgiveness? Now please hear me correctly. It isn't the case that God is asking us to forgive others as some kind of payback to God. This is not the case at all. Rather, showing forgiveness to others is a way of recognizing and appreciating our own need for forgiveness. And this is what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. 
as it says in Colossians 1, 13 to 14, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So we've been transported through our faith in Christ from one kingdom into another kingdom in whom we have the redemption and the forgiveness of sins. In other words, God's saving work on the cross not only spared us death, but also brought us into His kingdom, the kingdom of the Son, the kingdom of God's light, where we are invited to do what? Put off our old self, as Paul said. To be made new, he goes on to say, in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so when we become a follower of Christ, we receive the forgiveness of sins, we then find ourselves in God's kingdom, becoming a part of God's kingdom where we are called to grow more into the likeness of God, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So God starts to do his refining work in us by his spirit that we might be more into the likeness of Christ. And that's what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. There has to be radical change and transformation taking place in you. Let me put it a different way. Do you like cheesecake? Does everybody like a good old-fashioned cheesecake? Yeah? Who makes a good cheesecake in this this church? Raise your hands so I know when my next cheesecake is coming. I can see it, Paula. So Paula makes a good cheesecake, okay? Okay. I'm looking forward to eating that in your home one day. Okay. What, what do we find at the bottom of a cheesecake? What do we find at the bottom? Biscuit, good, yeah. Have you ever tried to make a cheesecake without the biscuit? It's not going to work, is it? Basically, the cheese, the topping, is. This, I'm not quite sure what the topping is called, but anyway, the topping is just going to go splat. Do you remember that picture that uh, Paolo showed last week of the three cakes? Do you remember that? The last one. Yeah, it would look like the last one. And it's the same principle with a trifle, isn't it? Who makes a good trifle? Now, I don't have sherry, okay? No sherry. I don't drink alcohol. So I'm looking forward, Gloria, to that moment when you come in with that nice trifle for me, okay? But it's the same principle, isn't it? What goes at the bottom of a trifle? Nobody makes a trifle here? Jelly? Is it jelly? Is it jelly and cake and... That's right. And then obviously the custard goes on top and the cream goes on top. You can see that I've got a, I've got a sweet tooth. And, and it's the same principle. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to explain is that the foundation, the base of the kingdom of God is built on forgiveness. That's the basis. You enter the kingdom of God through receiving the forgiveness of God and then you manifest forgiveness because you're now part of the kingdom of God. You know, as I was trying to think through how I might, you know, share this this idea with you, because sometimes we can hear things, you know, in the church, but sometimes we forget about them. So I was trying to think of creative ways, because I do know that forgiveness is hard. So I've tried cheesecake, I've tried trifle, and then as I was thinking about all of this, ping, my phone went, and I received this email from the turning, the turning is this initiative that, that encourages people to go out on the streets and to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And guess what the title of this email was? It was a testimony about the power of God's forgiveness. So I'm just going to read you because it, it really does explain what I've been trying to tell you this morning. A turning team was walking around Lambeth. Then one evening they met a man who was sat on a bench and was speaking on his phone One of the team clearly felt the Lord was saying that they should speak to him. The man finished his call and the team began to share the gospel. When they asked if he wanted to invite Jesus into his life, he said that he couldn't and then hung his head. The team asked why. At that point, the man said that he was planning to take revenge on a friend who had stolen money from him. But if he gave his life to Jesus, he wouldn't be able to do this. The team talked to him about the power of forgiveness. They said that if he accepted Jesus in his life, he would be able to forgive the person that had wronged him. After another moment of deep thought, the man agreed to let the team pray, and he asked Jesus Christ into his life. 
Just a few weeks later, and the situation with his friend had been completely restored. And now this new believer is being discipled. The real story. It's the power of forgiveness. And what is interesting about this example is that the man was initially reticent about accepting Christ because he knew that if he accepted Jesus in his life, he would be required to bestow forgiveness to the friend who stole from him. And so even before he committed his life to Jesus Christ, he had a sense, an intuitive sense, that God's kingdom would make a radical call on his life to live differently. In other words, when we choose to not forgive others, it's like basically saying to God, I don't want to be part of your kingdom. I don't want to honor your values. I don't want to abide by those values. Actually, I want to abide by the values of the world. Now, whilst I've sought to bring an encouragement this morning to model forgiveness, we all know that it is easier said than done. You know, sometimes it can be really difficult to live it out, particularly when we feel we've been unfairly and unjustly treated. And this being the case, how how, how might we cultivate a a heart that is quick and ready to forgive? Well, I think that there's some answers in the two verses that I read earlier from Matthew 6. So I'm just going to read those two verses again, and I'm just going to share a few very, very brief points for you to reflect upon. So Matthew 6, 14 to 15 says... For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And so this is my first point. Our capacity to forgive stems from appreciating that we are forgiven. God clearly knows that we're going to struggle to forgive others. And I believe that that is one of the reasons why Jesus doesn't just say in those verses, right, go and forgive others. But Jesus gives us the rationale for why we need to forgive others. But forgive others because God forgives you. And when we begin to understand this, our lives can act as ripples of God's loving forgiveness to those around us. And friends, it absolutely works. It absolutely works. You know, I often find myself, you know, If I feel somebody's done something wrong, then I find myself quietly ranting away for a few days until God brings me to that point of realization. Manoj, have you seen how much mess you create? You're not good. You're not perfect. You're a mess in need of Jesus Christ as well. When God brings me to that place, oh my goodness, I need forgiveness. Then I have the capacity to forgive others. King David was so right in saying in Psalm 103 that we must not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We mustn't forget the benefits that we receive from God, when we live in remembrance and memory of that, then we start to live out the values of the kingdom. My second point is this. Matthew 6, 14 to 15 encourages us to put forgiveness into practice. Jesus basically says, start to live it out, manifest it. You know, because forgiveness can't exist in some kind of theoretical sense, can it? It, you know, it's not going to happen if we just kind of have it somewhere there without actually doing something about it. We have to get our heart into motion and we have to go through the process of forgiving others. And that might happen in a variety of different ways. Maybe it's just a short prayer that you say. Nelson Mandela was right in saying resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Do you honestly think the resentment is going to kill your enemies? Who's it going to kill? It's going to kill yourself, isn't it? It's what happens. The reality is that unforgiveness doesn't poison the perpetrator, but the one who chooses to carry unforgiveness in their heart. And anyone who 
who does this knows exactly what it feels like. It's like carrying a heavy laden load on your back. Nelson Mandela learned many a lesson when he was cooped up in a small prison cell. And one of them was this, forgiveness liberates the soul. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Nelson Mandela, who was in a prison cell for many years. And he had a choice to make and that's the conclusion he came to. Forgiveness liberates the soul. And so what I endeavor to do in my own circumstances, I'm just trying to give you a window as to how I, how I deal with it after I've ranted for a while, is through gritted teeth often, it is gritted teeth in the early, early moments of it, I start to pray for that person. And when I pray, I'm praying, God bless that person. God pour out your favor on that person. It doesn't matter what they've said or done to me. I want God to pour out his favor in abundance. And it's interesting, as I start to do that, my heart changes. And also then God brings to the surface all the wrong that I've done in my life. We need to put it into practice quickly because if we don't, it takes root in our hearts and it festers. And then it's a lot more difficult to have it removed. Which brings me to my third and final point. Jesus not only emphasizes our personal need for forgiveness and the need to model it, but Jesus also, in those verses, highlights the consequences if we decide not to play ball. And then it's up to us to decide. You know, when we choose not to forgive, what God is saying is that the ramifications are huge. Now, what might help us to understand this point is to look at the parable of the unmerciful servant which Jesus shares in Matthew 18. By way of a reminder in this parable, there's a servant who owes a debt to a king and, and basically casts himself upon the king and says, look, show me mercy. You know, I can't pay this debt. And the king shows huge compassion and love and mercy and basically cancels the debt, writes it off. But then as we carry on reading the parable, how does the servant behave? to a fellow servant who owes him a debt. Well, the servant is not as merciful. He's not a person of grace. In fact, that servant is ruthless and throws his fellow servant into prison because that servant owes him a debt. Well, as you can imagine, the king is, is far from happy. In fact, as you read the parable, the king is livid, actually. <laughs> and, and this is how uh, the story unfolds. Verse 32 to 35 says this. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled. It's interesting that word cancel because that's what forgiveness does. If you look at the Hebrew interpretation of that word, the definition of that word, forgiveness, it's cancelled. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Difficult reading, isn't it? Very, very difficult reading. But in this is an important lesson for us all. As Matthew Henry said, Christ came into the world as the great peacemaker and not only to reconcile us to God, but to one another. And in this, we must comply with him. Basically, there's consequences if we choose not to comply. And so on this Remembrance Day, as we remember the fallen from the two world wars, as, as well as other conflicts, let us be mindful that, that peace is a vision that we can all strive towards. It stems from knowing the cost of the cross and how we've been transported into the kingdom of God's Son where we're called to live out the values of the kingdom. And these values are countercultural. We live in a society, a cancel culture society. Even somebody has told me once, you're cancelled. <laughs> somebody has said that to me. But we must remember that our allegiance is to a higher power. And whilst at times it may be hard to exercise forgiveness, 
God's grace is most able to do wonders through us so long as we have a willing spirit. If you've got a willing spirit, God's grace can help you. And I want to end with this. It's a well-known story. I know I have shared it in this church, maybe right at the start of me being in this church, so a few years ago. Um, and so I'm sure you know this story, but I just think it would be great to hear it once again because it really does explain what I've been trying to communicate this morning. It's a story um, uh, that happened after the apartheid had ended in South Africa. It's a true story of what forgiveness looks like when one recognizes their own status as a forgiven individual. The story is of a white police officer named Mr. Van der Boek, who was put on trial. The court found out that he'd come to a woman's house, he'd shot her son at point-blank range, and then burned the young man's body on a fire while he and his officers parted nearby. The woman's husband was also killed by the same men and his body was also burned. A member of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission turned to the woman and asked, so what do you want? How should justice be done for this man? And this, my friends, is how she replied. I want three things. I want first to be taken to the place where my husband's body was burned so that I can gather up the dust and give his remains a decent burial. My husband and son were my only family. I want secondly for Mr. Van der Boek to become my son. I would like for him to come twice a month to the ghetto and spend a day with me so that I can pour out on him whatever love I still have. And finally, I would like Mr. Van der Boek to know that I offer him my forgiveness because Jesus Christ died to forgive. And so I would kindly ask someone to come to my side and lead me across the courtroom so that I can take Mr. Van der Boek in my arms, embrace him, and let him know that he is truly forgiven. That, my friends, is the way of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, the power of your word that speaks into our lives, Lord. And Lord, having read your word, help us now to apply your word. And Lord, we know that forgiveness Showing forgiveness is not always easy, but we come before you this morning with a willing spirit and asking for your grace to be at work in our hearts, Lord, that we might live the way of Christ. Amen. precious blood.